by Riverside. Well, it's so good to welcome Mayor Woods to the show. How are you doing today, Mayor Woods? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you on. So I'm going to give you an easy question to kind of warm you into this, in, this conversation. What's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever got was from my father, who always uh, was not a, he's not a terribly religious person, but he's a person who obviously believes in treating people with kindness and respect. And one of the things he always said to me is, you know, Corey, remember the golden rule, treat people as you would want to be treated. And I find that that has been the thing that's helped to guide me most in the political arena is frankly, the whole concept of if I wouldn't want someone to talk to me a certain way, I'm not going to speak to them that way either. And so it's something that I keep with me on an everyday basis. And it's really helped to guide me as I've uh, gotten further and further in the political world and in the professional world in general. That's good advice. I like that because you do, uh, the way you talk to people really comes back to you and people will respect you or not respect you by the way they feel honored or dishonored by you in, in interaction. So I always do that try to do it with my podcast, no matter whether we agree or not, always be respectful and honor the person I'm talking to. So I, I like that approach. I appreciate, especially being your podcast guest this morning. I love to hear that you <laughs> abide by the same principle. Very, very comforting as a mayor of, a, of the ninth largest city in the state of Arizona. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not that I had any concerns. I didn't have any concerns at all, for the record. Oh, that's good to, that's good to know. <laughs> but you just never know. Nobody you wants to be know. blindsided, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, everybody brings something unique to the table. I'm kind of curious. What about your leadership style separates you from other people you, you run across? Uh, I'm a very... Um, how would I put this? I, I, I work very much in collaboration with others. I'm not a person who seeks to strong arm people. Uh, I, I'm not a person who tries to push you into doing things that you would otherwise would not want to do. My basic, because I've been in that position. When you've been in the political arena long enough, you've had many times where people will try to push you into making decisions that you're not personally comfortable with. And you have to always be able to look in the mirror in the morning or put your head down to the pillow at night and feel comfortable with what you've done that day or what you're going to do in the upcoming day. And so one of the things I've really tried to embody is, you know, try to talk to people about the issue, explain the both sides or multiple sides as you see them when you're trying to see where they might be on any, on any given thing. But don't attempt to push or bully people into positions that they otherwise wouldn't choose on their own. I just find that that's not a way to build lasting relationships and friendships and trust. And at the end of the day, it's a short term fix. The way you have a good long term relationship with people is you develop that level of trust and the ability to talk through complex, complicated issues, and that will serve you well in the long run. That's really insightful, I, especially in politics. You know, the day we have such divided, um, we have we have sides. And so how do you bring people together in collaboration? I, I took a class this summer in policymaking. And one of the key things is understanding as you're making policy, what what area are people coming from in terms of what is important to them as you make policy? And then how you evaluate those policies and make sure they are applicable to the people you're trying to uh, serve in those policies. So I appreciate your your approach to this. I, I mean, I, I always think that one of the big things is that you don't try to assume bad intent. And I think that's been one of the things that's become a challenge in our politics as a country uh, over the last few years. I, there's a time where, you know, where we used to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And I think now, and I'm not saying everyone's guilty of this, but I just see this happening more and more. There's this whole kind of, well, if you don't agree with me, it's because you must be doing something unethical or illegal, or you must be acting in bad faith, as opposed to just, look, I'm an intelligent person. I've read the material. I've tried to talk to my professional staff. And at the end of the day, this is where I've arrived on this issue. Doesn't mean that I might not be with you on another issue, either tomorrow or next week or next month. It just means on this issue, I'm not with you. And it doesn't mean that I've done anything wrong or that there's anything scandalous or nefarious that's actually happened. It just means that I, I've grown up differently. I have a different understanding of the material. I have a different background and context that I'm bringing to the conversation. And I may have arrived at a different place. But I think we have to get back to that as a society, that we have to stop assuming 
that because someone doesn't agree with you or doesn't side with you on any particular issue on any given day, that somehow they're doing something wrong and that they're not acting in good faith. I think that's what leads us down this path of being so divided and not being able to have conversations and just sort of generally creating a lot of division in our country. I think we have to start getting past that. I think we have to start getting past it yesterday. Yeah, I agree with you. Definitely. It's encouraging to hear someone in your position to say that. Cause I think we, we don't hear that a lot from our, from people who are leaders and we need to hear that. Cause I think as a country, we're more in the middle than we are on the extremes. And so how do we work together to, for the common good of all people? You, you know, one of the quick thing I'll say about that too, is that, you know, there are times where people every now and then will accuse me of just being too nice or being naive. And that's perhaps <laughs> why I'm talking about this. It's not about any of that. I'm, I'm not in any way, shape or form or not naive. I'm a 44 year old man who, you know, and, and someone who's gone through quite a bit in my life. And it's not about being naive or being too nice. It's about me simply trying to model the kind of behavior that I would want to see in the world. And if I want other people to try to see the good in others and try to put their best foot forward when it comes to collaboration and not assume any malicious intent, then I have to behave in the same fashion. I can't sort of do all this, you know, we'll do as I say, not as I do. Uh, people don't buy that. If you, if you want to actually model that kind of behavior, you have to be willing to do it yourself, even when you're in such a world as, as politics. And so, and so right, I, I sort of, that's one of the things I try to tell people on a very consistent basis is don't think that for whatever reason that I'm, that I'm a naive person or I'm just being too nice or I haven't encountered, uh, you know, difficulty in my own life. Really, it's just a matter of, I know where I'm trying to get. I know the kind of world I want to see, and I very much try to model that when I walk out of my front door every morning. Not a bad thing to be considered too nice. <laughs> you know, but, I yeah. wouldn't think so, but there are times when people say that to me. They'll go, oh, you know, you're, you're too nice. You're not going to succeed in the political arena. I said, I've been an elected official for 11 years in the city of Tempe. I think I've succeeded just fine. Um, you know, I, I, and I feel like at this point of my career, uh, what I really want to do, the, if there was any kind of legacy I'd like to leave, is that, you know, I, I, I had the ability to bring people together around very difficult, sometimes divisive issues. And I just, you know, and hopefully I encouraged a culture of people, free, frankly, being better to one another and being good to one another. If that if that's the one thing that I leave behind after I leave elected life, I'll feel like I I'll feel like I've accomplished something pretty big. Great. I, I read your bio. I'm curious to have you tell us your journey, your story. How did you get from where you grew up to where you're sitting right now in this position? You know, one of the things that I tell people all the time, so I'm, I'm actually an adopted child of two uh, wonderful parents. My brother and I are actually both adopted children from two different families. And I think that that was something that always really, um, really encouraged me as a child. I remember always thinking to myself that, you know, my life could have ended up in a very different place, but I was fortunate to end up with two tremendously uh, amazing parents who gave me every opportunity I could have ever hoped for. And so I've just tried every day to make good on that. I've tried very uh, hard to, uh, you know, for, to do well in school when I was young, to continue uh, you know, fighting for people, fighting for people who many times otherwise wouldn't have a voice uh, as an adult. And I think that that very much at a 30,000 foot level has really kind of steered me during my, not just my childhood, but my adult and my professional life. And, uh, you know, everything from, you know, going to college and getting a master's degree to getting involved in the political world to now spending 12 years in the uh, K-12 education space. You know, it really, a lot of that has been guided by, uh, you know, that early adoption and frankly, just feeling very fortunate and very blessed and trying to make sure that I'm doing whatever I can to help others, uh, you know, through, through in, in pretty much whatever I do. And so, you know, I, I could go through every piece of my bio, but frankly, people could read that online through the City of Tempe's website or wherever that wherever else they'd like to check. I, but I feel like, you know, pe people really want to know who I am at my core and at the root and how I became who I am and what motivates me when I get out of bed every morning. That pretty much sums it up. I love that. Are there people in your life along this journey who served as inspirations for you? Uh, absolutely. My parents, my mother and my father, my younger brother, uh, they've been an inspiration to me each and every day. Uh, I've got plenty of other people that I come across on a, on a regular basis who inspire me to be better and to challenge myself to do bigger and better things. 
uh, all the time. But I would just have to say at, at my core, it really is my parents and my brother who were the closest people to me and who really have inspired me to reach for whatever goals or lofty heights that I've ever wanted to accomplish. They've never told me that I couldn't do something. They've always told me that they believed in me. And frankly, that's helped give me the fuel I've needed to keep going, even when I've at times encountered setbacks. So without that really solid core and foundation, at least for me personally, I don't think I would have been able to achieve what I have. That's amazing. Good to always give a shout out to those people in our life who inspire us. And sometimes they don't hear it from us enough. So I always give my guests a chance to just kind of say thank you to those people who mean so much to us. Absolutely. In order to get to position you are right now, you had to have a vision for why you want to run for mayor. So what what is your vision for Tempe? So a few things, actually, I, I, you know, I'm a big advocate for affordable housing, and that was one of the things that initially got me to run for the city council and later for mayor. I really wanted to implement a plan with a dedicated funding stream and some different changes to how the city does things and also have some influence on the statewide and federal levels to change policy to create more uh, affordable and attainable housing options for people living in our city and across the valley. That's been one of the biggest things that motivated me to not only get into politics, but get back into it after a four year hiatus. Uh, I've been very, very much an advocate for uh, economic development. I mean, I feel that in order to pay for the things that people want, whether it's uh, firefighters, uh, police officers, uh, transportation needs, sustainability goals, affordable housing, you need to have enough revenue coming in to ensure that you can run the city very effectively and make sure you have the funding to hire the people uh, that you need to perform all the jobs or have the money to provide the necessary uh, capital investment and the infrastructure you need uh, to, to move things forward that are very critically important to our residents and business owners. And so that's always been a very crucial thing from my perspective. Uh, and, 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 and also, you know, when it comes to even, you know, working with our unsheltered population, I mean, we've done, we've acquired a 40 room motel during my time with uh, federal recovery dollars we received a couple of years ago. We just received another $7.3 million from Maricopa County to acquire uh, another 120 room hotel or motel uh, to create more opportunities for people who are currently living on our streets or in our parks. And so from my perspective, uh, it really is speaking for people many times who don't have access to high powered attorneys or lobbyists or people of that nature. Uh, it really is trying to give those folks a voice in our community and within our government. But it's also about trying to make sure that you do the things that allow for you to run a successful government, like making sure that you have a, you know enough economic development happening, that there's enough revenue being generated on the operations and on the capital side to make sure that people have the things that they need to live a successful life in your city. And I think without all of those things working synergistically uh, and collaboratively, uh, you can't get any of these things done. So I've tried very hard to strike a balance between all of those things during my tenure as mayor and during my previous eight years as a member of the city council. I've lived in uh, some major cities in my life. I lived in Detroit for a while, St. Louis, Milwaukee, uh, Chicago. And you're right. I think affordable housing is a challenge. I looked at this uh, this morning. I think I saw a report that with the interest rates, it's harder and harder for even young people to even consider buying their first home. So what are some of the challenges you have faced and you try to overcome in dealing with affordable housing um, piece you're trying to fix? Well, and so I'm a very personal note about that too. So, I mean, I actually owned a home for 14 years, right in roughly about central Tempe and sold that home back in June of 2020, about a month before I became mayor. And I've actually been renting an apartment in downtown Tempe ever since. So for about three years. And one of the main reasons is because I wanted to live uh, in a downtown urban environment where I had the ability to walk to and from work and to other places, whether it was restaurants or other retail establishments. And I really wanted to have a lower carbon footprint. So I've tried very hard to live my own values going very much back to what I talked about earlier. You know, you have to you have, you have to model the kind of behavior that you want others to practice. Uh, but, but, but some of that, too, was the fact that 
in, you know, home prices are extremely high, interest rates are extremely high. And so, you know, right now I'm saving up money eventually to buy another place, whether it's in the downtown or somewhere else within the city of Tempe. But at, at this point in time, it's just too expensive for me to take that plunge. And uh, so I, I personally have encountered that on a very personal level. Uh, I own the home that I owned for 14 years. Uh, unfortunately, because of where the market was, I was locked into a very bad interest rate for, you know, about probably 12 of those 14 years. And so I've lived that experience on a very personal level. It's not just something I simply talk about. A lot of what I'm fighting for are, are based on things that I've experienced on a very personal level. But when it comes to just matters of public policy, unfortunately, the challenge is we don't have all the tools from my perspective we need in the state of Arizona to create more affordable housing. We don't have access to tools such as rent control and inclusionary zoning and tax increment financing because they've all been banned by previous state legislatures. And these are tools that are being used in other cities and towns and states throughout the United States uh, to create more attainable housing for people of all different income levels and of all different occupations. And so my perspective is we have to try to find a way to not only work locally here just in the city of Tempe, but also work with the state legislature and the governor's office to change some of those things. And from my perspective, create new policies or roll back some of those previous preemptions to give us the tools that we need in our 91 cities and towns to provide more affordable housing for people who really need it. Folks in the public safety arena, our teachers, our people working in the service industry, the list just goes on and on. So, I mean, so not only have I experienced this from a personal level, but that personal experience helps to inform what I fight for as the mayor of the city of Tempe. And one of the things I really want us to see, want us to change on a very proactive level are some of those what I consider to be very regressive policies that uh, that really handcuff us when it comes to creating more affordable housing options that people desperately need in our community and across the state of Arizona. You also mentioned something I want, to, I want to go back to, too. You said you're also big into community development. Uh, one of the projects we did for, for class a year ago um, was we were trying to create a sustainable system. And then because I, I spending so much time in Detroit, I saw the brokenness of Detroit. And one thing I told my wife just recently was the most frustrating thing about Detroit was the number of African-American people in Detroit who didn't own anything. Um, and I was like it was it was a very troubling situation to watch. And I'm kind of curious, our idea was if we could create uh, corporate and uh, community partnerships, maybe we could find a way to develop ownership with the members in that community. So they were owning the businesses that were coming into the communities. What are you trying to do and accomplish as community development to better the people in those communities? So I, I should have mentioned this before, you know, I actually lived in Detroit for a couple of years as a child. My father uh, in the mid 80s was the uh, president CEO of the Detroit Urban League for a couple of years. So I, you know, had some early kind of upbringing in the Detroit area and then went back to college at University of Michigan from 1996 to 2000. Actually, I'll be back in Michigan in probably less than a couple of weeks time visiting some old friends from undergrad. So I've got a, I've got some ties to that part of the country as well. Um, but I mean, I do think that one of the biggest things is. Uh, we do have to, you know, help people. I mean, I, I'm very, very focused on trying to help African-Americans rise in the ranks of whether it's owning their own small businesses or, or, or attaining high level positions in existing companies and organizations. Uh, but I think it's very important to help African-Americans and other people of color, women, uh, members of the LGBTQ community uh, to make sure that they have access to these opportunities, which historically have not necessarily been available to them. Uh, I think that it's one of the great ways, whether it's owning your own uh, business or nonprofit or just, you know, it, whether it's sort of gaining access to the financial systems, it's one of the best ways to create generational wealth and to be able to pass something down to your children and your grandchildren and others that you love and care about. You know, actually, one of the first people who really taught me a lot about that was my younger brother, interestingly enough, who works in the private sector out on, you know, in kind of the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic area. But he was one of the first people that spent a lot of time talking to me about the whole notion of saving my money and doing things that allowed me to create uh, generational wealth. Because when I was in my 20s and 30s, I didn't spend a lot of time worrying about that at all. Uh, I, I very much was like, hey, if, if money came in, I just spent it, you know, just because 
you know, I was just excited to be able to have some money in my pocket to go out and eat or to buy something. And he was one of the first people that basically said to me, look, you've got to try to find ways to have things that are not completely disposable or where you're not just at the whims of other people. And so he really has been a very steadying, uh, influential influence in my life when it comes to that. So I think whatever we can do to create opportunities for uh, for entrepreneurs, and I've, and I've done a lot of that work in terms of uh, partnering with not just the city of Tempe, but obviously partnering with uh, for-profit corporations and nonprofits to make sure that we're providing grant money and startup money to local small business owners to help them either start a company or expand an existing company, hire more employees. Even frankly, during the pandemic, I was trying very hard to help small business owners gain access to uh, to loans, I mean, to PPP loans, to make sure that they could keep their doors open dur during what was a very uncertain time, uh, not just in the country, but frankly, in the world. And, and, and so I think that, that that is one of the very key ways that people can uh, build wealth and have something to pass on to themselves, uh, to, not to the, pass on to others in the community and to other family members and friends is by making sure that they kind of own their own uh, you know, enterprise and have and have basically access to their own resources. And so I think that's one of the things that we've tried to do very much in the city of Tempe with a lot of the business entrepreneurship programs that we've supported and continue to support. Uh, and it's something that I know myself and the council have very shared values on. So it's something I know we're, we're going to continue to do. It's one of the benefits of also being uh, part of a very diverse city council, frankly, uh, in the state of Arizona. I mean, being the first African-American council member, the first African-American mayor of the city, having our first African-American councilwoman in Verdetta Hodge, first Native American councilwoman uh, in, in Dorian Garland, first Asian-American council member uh, in Arlene Chin. I think a lot of what we try to do is, frankly, we know many of the opportunities that people who we look like have not been uh, have not had access to previously. And we try very hard to make sure that we're that we're reversing those trends uh, in office here in the city of Tempe. So I'm excited about the possibilities and the opportunities that lie ahead. That's awesome. So you just attended a gathering of a bunch of mayors across the country and you guys talked about some very heady topics. I mean, you had issues like public safety, mental health, technology, innovation, achieving functional zero zones, homelessness, infrastructure, immigration. Which of those topics that you guys covered, you think besides housing, most impacts the people of Arizona and especially Tempe? So I was uh, fortunate to moderate a panel on unsheltered homelessness on the last full day that I was at the conference. And I did it with a number of mayors from the California area. And so I thought that was a very impactful session, not necessarily because of my moderating it, but frankly, because of the people who were serving on the panel. And we had a really full room uh, full of other mayors from across the country and cities, both small, medium and large. And I thought that was very interesting. I mean, there were a lot of ideas that I took from that uh, in terms of other kinds of innovation that I could bring back to the city of Tempe or even things that, you know, that they have tried that have worked or things that they've tried that haven't worked as well. And so that for me was a very, very impactful session uh, when it came to homelessness, because it's something that is really uh, been very challenging across the entire state of Arizona. And you've seen many cities in the East and West Valley here uh, really grapple with that issue in a very major way. But that panel and just hearing what, what those mayors brought to the table and frankly, uh, getting the insight through whether it was through comments or questions that the other mayors just sitting around the table had during the course of that roughly 90 minute session, I thought was tremendously helpful and allowed me to bring a lot of ideas back to the city of Tempe that have proved to be very helpful, even though the conference was only a month ago. We all see the homeless problem when we watch television. What did you bring back that you found is the most helpful that you've discovered works well in your area? So one of the things I, 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 we, that we talked about quite a bit was trying to just simply increase the stock of affordable housing. That was one of the things that was talked about fairly extensively during that session, is that one of the, one of the reasons why we are seeing 
more senior citizens. And frankly, they are the fastest growing group of people who are ending up homeless as a result of rising mortgages and rising rents. They're living on fixed incomes. They don't really many times have the opportunity to earn more money because a lot of them are out of the workforce at this point. And they're finding themselves more and more living on the streets or, or ending up homeless just because they can't afford the rising costs that they're experiencing. And so one of the things that we talked about was, look, we just have to find ways to create policies that create more affordable housing opportunities. We shouldn't have people in their 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s living on the streets or being forced to live in substandard or subpar conditions because there aren't affordable housing options available to them. And so that was one of the things that I really took was this affordable housing thing is not just an issue or a challenge, it's a crisis. And it's one that we really have to address head on because otherwise we're gonna see more people looking like our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents living in very, very substandard conditions if we don't get a handle on this very quickly. And so from my perspective, that was the biggest takeaway I took from that session. And it's something that we're very dedicated to working on right here in the city of Tempe. I love that. I'm, I'm inspired by this conversation and also just the things you're doing. If you had a message to young people today who were just starting out, what advice would you have for them? I would tell them to get involved in public service. And that doesn't mean necessarily running for office. If you want to run for office, that's great. Whether it's school boards, city council, state legislature, whatever it happens to be, uh, those are wonderful things. I mean, I, I, I've never run for anything other than uh, you know, a city council seat or a mayor's seat. So my whole career has been in nonpartisan uh, municipal government. But those other opportunities are also wonderful. But if not, uh, you know, the city of Tempe has over 30 boards and commissions for volunteers who live in this community, everything from economic development to transportation to environmental sustainability um, to parks and rec to trans. I mean, I mean, all of these things have a board or commission where you work with very seasoned professional staff and provide insight and analysis and recommendations to the city council so we can actually make more informed policy decisions at this level. So I would tell people whether it's running for office, getting involved in one of those boards or commissions, uh, you know, perhaps getting involved in, in nonprofits in your community. One of my first pieces of involvement in the city of Tempe was joining my local Kiwanis club. Um, you know, I've also been involved with, you know, groups like Tempe Community Action Agency that helps people with rent and utility assistance and finding uh, affordable housing and shelter. I, I, you know, whatever it is, whatever your passion is, there is a group that is dedicated to that issue. So I would, I would just tell young people that getting involved in public service and in the nonprofit world and doing good work is not just relegated to people who are older. You can start doing that immediately. And I mean, and I started, for, you know, first really getting involved in my community back when I was only 26 years old uh, and I'm almost 45 now and I haven't stopped ever since. Even the four years that I was off the city council, I was still very much involved in a, in a number of nonprofit boards in our community from Newtown Community Development Corporation that works on affordable housing issues to you know Landings Credit Union, which is a local credit union here in the city of Tempe and throughout the valley, uh, to Friendship Village, which is a senior retirement facility right on the border of the cities of Tempe and Mesa. Uh, so I, I find that that kind of involvement helps me to feel very involved in the community, helps me to feel like I'm contributing something and giving back. Uh, and really makes you feel more connected to the, to the city of the town that you live in. So whatever it is, whether it's nonprofit service or city sanctioned boards and commissions or running for office yourself, I would encourage young people to get active and to stay involved. That's awesome. So Mayor, what are you most excited about today? I'm excited about the opportunity to make a difference. I mean, every morning when I get up and uh, leave the house. I, I feel like there's something that we could hopefully do better tomorrow uh, or the next day. And, and so for me, I, I think the sky's the limit at all the times. So I'm kind of an eternal optimist that even if something didn't go well on Tuesday, I think it's going to go great on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And so for me, uh, I always see the opportunity to create uh more affordable housing for people in our community that need it to create more opportunities for jobs for people who are leaving college or for people uh, all over the income or 
uh, you know, economic spectrum. I, I see opportunities to expand our public transportation system to ensure that people can get around without the use of a single use automobile or have the ability to very positively affect climate change. I mean, all of those things, uh, when I leave the house every morning, uh, I see possibilities for good things uh, to happen. And, and so I'm excited every day I get up, whether it's on a weekday or a weekend, that we can create even more positive change in our community that's really going to help a broad spectrum of people. And I think as long as you have that kind of positive attitude, good things can happen and the community will continue to move forward in a very positive way. But, you know, once again, I mean, the most important thing you got to remember is some things you're going to try are going to work. Some things that you're going to try are going to fail, but you got to get up and dust yourself back off and get up and keep trying. You just can't give up and throw in the towel. There are too many people who are relying on you and depending on you to give up when the going gets tough. I love it. You already asked, answered my favorite question to ask is what's your legacy? Um, unless you want to add something else to that. No, I mean, I, I would say that I'm still attempting to build it. But I honestly, I will say I don't spend a lot of time thinking about legacy during the course of my day. I'm too uh, consumed with the things that have to be done in my job and the nearly 200,000 residents that I serve, along with our city council and our professional staff here in the city of Tempe. So I don't spend any time during the day thinking about what my legacy is going to be like. I just try very hard to focus on doing a good job and serving our constituents. And I feel like if you do a good job and you put your best foot forward, the legacy stuff will, it'll take care of itself. When you leave public office and people have a chance to think back and reflect on your career in public service, they'll write that story for you. But I find if you're too focused on that while you're trying to do the job, then you're just sort of, you know, looking at polls and focus groups to make decisions. And that means you're not necessarily always even just following your own moral compass. You're too busy trying to do things that are popular as opposed to doing the thing that is actually right and correct. And so from my perspective, uh, I just try to get up in the morning and do the right thing and put my best foot forward and work as hard as I can. And eventually, you know, the legacy stuff will take care of itself. And I just hope that people can look back on my service and say, uh, he did a good job. He put, he gave everything to the city of Tempe. Uh, and now he can go rest and do whatever he wants to do for the rest of his life. Good. Anything I haven't asked you, Mary, that you wanted to address? No, I just really appreciate the opportunity to do this. It's a great way to start my morning and, you know, just appreciate the opportunity for us to be able to chat more. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I, I have, uh, you know, been in this job now for just a little over three years. I've got one year left in my term. I'm hopefully going to be able to continue on longer in this role, but I, I've had a wonderful time. It's been an incredible experience and I've met wonderful people, developed some bonds that are going to be uh, everlasting. Uh, and, and so I, I'm just truly excited about what the future holds. I think, you know, we live in an amazing city here in Tempe. Uh, and, and I just think the best is yet to come. So I, I can't wait to see what happens when I walk out my door this morning. Well, I've enjoyed visiting Tempe several times. So it's, it's a great city to go to. I caught some good baseball there while I was there. So I've, yeah. I've loved visiting Tempe. I was just Where at can... Tempe Diablo Stadium last night for our uh, yeah. annual fireworks show. So I was just <laughs> I was just where I know you spent a lot of afternoons enjoying some spring training. Yeah, definitely. Got a chance to actually watch, I think, Clayton Kershaw and uh, Madison Bumgarner pitch when I was up there visiting that's, one time. So. That's, that's excellent. excellent. <laughs> I, I, play, I played baseball in middle school and high school and, you know, for, I, I, you know, stopped playing at the end of my sophomore year. But I always I was wishing that I had continued. But, you know, what, what, what got me out of playing baseball was getting involved in student government at a very high level. And I just unfortunately didn't have time for both. It came time in my junior year of high school that I was told I more or less had to choose. Either you're going to really deepen your commitment to the public service world or you're going to continue to play baseball and try to go into the minor leagues and i made my decision which my dad thought was crazy at the time he's like Corey, you only have your athletic ability but for so long you will probably have your mind for the rest of your life but at that point i felt very uh called to get more involved in the student government and public service role and you know from, from my perspective it's worked out well for me so i i feel very fortunate people tell people are very fortunate as well where Thank can you. people follow you and what you're doing and, and connect with you on social media? You know, I, I'm on pretty much every social media site with the exception of TikTok. So people can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. 
Uh, you know, whether I've got personal pages, I've got my city pages, I've got I got a little bit of everything going on. But uh, or you could just simply go to our Tempe.gov homepage and look me up there and send me an email or give me a call. But, uh, you know, and, and I will tell you, I answer all of my own social media. That's one of the other things that always shocks people is that, you know, when, you, when you're in a city that has um, less staffing when it comes to mayor and council, I have about roughly one and a half people in my office here. So. All of the social media that you see, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those things, I answer all of them personally. So sometimes that surprises people, especially when they're upset with me about something. They'll start kind of going in on me. And next thing you know, they write back and they can clearly tell from the speaking style or the way that I'm writing that this isn't a person on staff. This is obviously Corey responding to this on his computer or on his cell phone. And so, uh, you know, I, I try very hard to uh, make sure that I am responsive to our residents. And when they say they're getting me on that screen, they really are getting me. Well, thank you so much, Mayor, for taking the time. I know this is a busy time for you, but I really appreciate this conversation and blessings on what you're doing. And may God continue to watch over you. Thank you so much, Keith. Really appreciate the time and the opportunity.